Hello, everybody. It's time to start uh, today's uh, second panel. My name is uh, Christian Lundby Gjerde. I'm a senior researcher at NUPI, and I have the pleasure of chairing this, this panel. And this panel is dedicated to uh, questions that unfortunately are of uh, acute uh, topical relevance. We will look into how the military's role in Russian society and the Russian economy is, uh, is changing. We will um, hear about um, the war's impact on the economy, about uh, developing relations between the civilian and the military leadership in Russia, and we will uh, learn about uh, militarization and patriotic upbringing. Um, we are very pleased to have three excellent researchers with us in this panel, and they all follow events in their fields very closely. Um, so without taking up uh, more of their time, I'm, I will introduce the first speaker, Cecilia Sensa. Cecilia Sensa. <laughs> she, um, she, she is a principal scientist at the, um, to get it completely right, at the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. Oh, thank you, Christian. Um, Russia's defense spending has surged since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. While this level of expenditure might not be sustainable, I will argue that it may take some time before the spending levels have to be reduced. At FFI, we've been monitoring the Russian defense spending since the mid-2000s. There have been several surprises along the way. For instance, in 2007, Putin signed an armament program that should cost 5,000 billion rubles, which seemed tremendous at that time. Uh, the defense spending had to be risen by one third. Uh, I really didn't believe that this would happen, given the history since the Soviet, uh, uh, Soviet Union. Now we come to learn that this was just the start of the remilitarization of the Russian economy. The short war against Georgia highlighted the need for larger reforms within the Russian armed forces. The year after, Sedukov, the defense minister at that time, launched reforms in order to professionalize the armed forces. And in 2011, the reforms were followed up by launching a new rearmament program. Putin declared that he was almost afraid to mention the numbers. This time, they will spend around 19,000 billion rubles until 2020. Um, I had some annual defense orders, and it didn't really amount to this number, but still, it was a tremendous increase of the Russian defense spending. And a lot of the equipment were modernized, even though the development projects didn't really meet the expectations. I think the big surprise for me was the failure of the development projects. After all, this happens in all Western countries as well, the delays in uh, programs. But the willingness to pump up the defense spending to this level came as a surprise. After all, Russia hadn't spent this much on defense in the entire post-Soviet history. But as it turned out, these levels were not even close to the level that Russia is spending on its armed forces today. Measured in 2024 prices, the defense spending has risen from approximately 4,000 billion rubles a year so next year, measured in this year's uh, prices, it will be 12,500. It means that defense spending has tripled since before the war. And this is quite annoying, as we in the Western countries have put on the most substantial sanctions throughout history. Why is it not working? Um, I'll take you back to April 2022. Different estimates suggested that the Russian economy would shrink by 8 to 15 percent, which would set uh, the economy 10 years behind, its, uh, behind. However, it didn't end up like that. The economy only shrank by 1.2 percent. The story that Moscow doesn't want to get lifted is how much it got help from the high petroleum prices. In 2022, 
the petroleum income increased by more than 4,000 billion rubles, while defense spending only rose by 2,000. So Russia gained actually more on the petroleum income than it lost from defense spending. Secondly, the GDP growth has gotten a lot of help from the high public spending. For 22 and 23, uh, the budget impulse was 10% of GDP. The budget impulse is how much the state helps pumping up the GDP. 10%. But the economy shrank by 1.2% in uh, 22 and grew only by 3.5%. It means that had it not been for the high public spending, the, uh, the economy would, would have shrank quite much more. Which means don't give up on the sanctions quite yet. But it could be an idea to try to cut down on the Russia's earning on oil and gas further. And this brings me into the second and most important part of my contribution to the Russia conference this year. How much further can Russia continue waging the war? And this time I'll try not to be so surprised <laughs> about the willingness. My answer for this is unfortunately not that uplifting. I believe that this can go on for quite a few years on. And this is uh, due to four factors. It's the macroeconomic development, the petroleum income, the uh, access to technology, and possibilities of reprioritizations within the defense budget. Both the macroeconomy and the petroleum incomes is related to Russia's ability to spend on defense. The technological axle is the cost of providing defense, and the federal budget is about the willingness to spend on the defense. Uh, first of all, the macroeconomic development. The Russian Central Bank has actually uh, lifted concerns regarding the development at this time. For the time being, the economy is booming, in fact, the growth rates haven't been this high since 2012, if you look apart from the correction that happened after, um, after the corona pandemics. The latest analysis from Bank of Finland shows that the capacity utilization rates have reached historically unprecedented levels. This has led to challenges for the overall economy. The central bank has not managed to control the inflation rates despite multiple increases in the key rate. In July, the central bank director, Elvira Nabulina, warned that if the government did deviate from the planned path for the public spending, there would be increased risk for a hard landing of the economy. A hard landing would imply a sharp reduction in economic growth, high increase in employment rates, investment drops, and lower demands for goods and services. This would affect the public income, and hence the ability to keep up the spending. However, I, even though the risk is there, I doubt that this is a likely outcome. One of the reasons is the government's deep involvement in the overall economy. For example, in 2020, the state owned 72% of the banking sector, which stands for 87% of all assets in the Russian economy. This gives the government extra measures to balance the economy, even when it goes through a windy day. Secondly, the petroleum income. In total, one third of the federal budget income stems from the petroleum sector. The sanctions toward this sector had consequently immediate effects for the income, but Russia has eventually adapted to the new situation. As shadow fleet of transport vessels have kept Russia's oil export up to the same levels as pre-war, and enabled Russia to sell oil prices well above the price cap imposed by G7 and EU. In addition, the government has decided to tax the sector based on the Brent's blend prices, so it doesn't really matter what the real prices are anyway. Uh, and the cost of avoiding sanction or accepting lower levels of the real prices of the Ural soil will be carried out by the petroleum companies. In the long run, this affects the profitability and ability to reinvest in the sector meaning that today's approach of waging the war is overloading the system and affecting the potential federal income in the future. But for the time being, this works out for the federal state. Thirdly, 
the technological access and the consequences for the defense output. Because the question is not how much can Russia afford to spend on defense, but what do they get out of the money? The sanctions have affected Russia's access to advanced technology and the ability to conduct international settlements. And this has really had uh, high effects on the costs within the industry. Many Russian companies report about high cost growth and that the contracts they have settled with the government is not able to adjust, they're not able to adjust for the price growth. So they have to carry the cost growth themselves. In addition, our research at FFI which has shown that uh, most of the deliveries to the armed forces now has been based on modernized equipment taken out of stocks. The stocks will empty out. This means that if Russia are to uh, have the same defense output over time, the cost will probably be increased, meaning that the defense budget will have to be increased uh, without the production increasing at the same level. And this year, oh no, for 25, the budget uh, will, the defense budget is increased by 30%, uh, but I guess that most of this will be lost due to defense specific inflation. Fourthly, the budget imbalances and ability re to reprioritize within the budget. This factor is related to both the fiscal income and how the money is spent. The Russian federal budget has run by deficit every year since the full scale invasion. The deficit has been covered by the increased petroleum income, tapping the national welfare fund, increased government debt, and extraordinary lump sum taxes voluntarily paid by highly profitable companies. But basing a budget, an annual budget on lump sum taxes is not a sustainable way to keep the income up. Um, consequently, the Russian government has decided to increase taxes for both private companies and private persons, meaning that less money will be spent by the private sector and more by the government. Um, this is one way of reprioritizing the national resources, and this access to resources is probably not completely exhausted. Because we have seen, due to the factors we were talking about earlier today, the low unemployment rates, the high wage growth, means that people, most people are better off now than they were pre-war levels. And meaning that they are probably able to suffocate even higher tax levels and still be better off than they were before the war. Furthermore, the government plans to continue increasing the national debt, meaning that the cost of war won't secure before the debt falls due. And we have looked into the debt data. When does this occur? It turns out it's not before late in the 2030s meaning that this is also an unexhausted resource for keeping the budget imbalanced for many years to come. In the long run, of course, this is not a sustainable way of financing the Russian public spending, and in the long run, challenges can become significant. But it gives the Russian government time to adapt and adjust. In the meantime, we expect that the level of secrecy and the federal budget will increase and that other budget chapters might increasingly finance the militarization of the Russian economy, implying that we must expect that Russia's ability to wage war will continue for even more years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Cecilia. Uh, I will then invite our second speaker, Kirill Shamiev, who is a visiting fellow at the European Council of Foreign Relations, and his presentation is titled How Civil Military Relations Shape Russia's War Effort. Oh, dear. All right. Um, Thank you very much for having me and organizing this conference. It's a great pleasure to be here and also in this beautiful city. Um, I've been studying civil military relations basically since my uh, bachelor's degree, and today I'm going to be talking about the policy aspect of Russian civil military relations. Just a short disclaimer, there are four main pillars in Russian civil military relations. It's about the civilian control over the military, whether they intervene in Russian domestic politics. This is out of the question. Then it's about the societal and military relationship on the level of human-to-human -human interactions, and some of my colleagues have already covered this in the previous panel. 
Another level is the control of the government of the military behavior on the battlefield, and this is, I'm not going to be talking about this today, but I will be discussing uh, the civilian government ability to make the military to do, to implement defense policies and make the Russian armed forces more effective as they want it to happen. In the policy um, vocabulary, it means to the government, the civil military policy aspect of the Russian civil military relations is whether the policy inputs that the Russian government gives to the military produce expected policy outcomes. And our previous colleagues from the previous panel talked a lot how the Russian authoritarian government has been able consistently to shape the Russian society, Russian domestic affairs, the Russian economy. But I would say that during the 25 years of Vladimir Putin in power, since 1999, when he was appointed as the interim prime minister, um, his ability to modernize Russian military was probably one of the harshest and most difficult areas where Vladimir Putin personally and the Russian government in general was trying to do. 25 years of several reform attempts that did not produce expected policy outcomes. And the disastrous war, the poor performance of the Russian military with the war in Georgia in 2008, and the disastrous invasion of Ukraine in 2022. In general, there are two key enablers of Russian policy, uh, policy aspect of civil military relations. It's the quality of internal monitoring and evaluation mechanisms, which has been consistently absent in Russian civil military relations, and the quality of the Russian Ministry of Defense leadership and bureaucratic effectiveness. And this is what has, been, has started to change this year with the appointment of the new Minister of Defense. So, and the question I'm trying to explore here is how resilient Russian civil military relations during the uh, Russo-Ukrainian war. In these uh, almost three years, Russian civil military relations has been, have been under enormous and I would say unprecedented since 1917 uh, pressure or turbulence. First, the disastrous beginning of the invasion, uh, a lot of professional soldiers lost, extremely high level of attrition, a lot of modern equipment procured over the last 10 years destroyed or abandoned. Then the announcement of partial military mobilization that was shock not only for the civilians who, as colleagues said before, were discovered that they had to fight in this war, but also for the military and the Ministry of Defense who, that was not ready to process hundreds of thousands of people, of civilians from the, civil, from the civilian world to the military through the military recruitment centers. Then the uh, Evgeny Prigozhin's mutiny in 2023, in June 2023, that's again, uh, for the first time in many years, an organized military force, although way outside the official, um, say, sector of Russian civil military relations, tried to take over part, uh, power in Moscow. And lastly, it's the reshuffle in the Russian Ministry of Defense and criminal cases against civilian and military leadership after May uh, this year. Uh, all in all, in almost three years, the military remained under political control, even during Prigozhin's mutiny, uh, but protective of its institutional autonomy and hence uh, resisted, uh, resistive to the civilian-driven changes. At the same time, the civilian government responses to both the shocks and ideas how to develop the Russian military to fight the war against Ukraine was largely reactive and extraordinary. Uh, this, is, this is going to be published. It's a memo that's going to be published on the Poners website. And for that, I analyzed the individuals of both those who resigned, 31 individuals, and those who were appointed in, in this almost half a year of time. And also, I traced the legal amendments to Russian federal laws regulating civil military relations. And there were 48 relevant amendments, relevant to, amendments relevant to this topic. So what do we have here? Um, the Russian Minister of Defense and the Chief of the General Staff uh, are two key individuals in Russian civil military relations, in addition to the President. But the President cannot be changed in Russia. The Minister of Defense and the Chief of the General Staff can. These are, I call them Troika, three individuals that define first what would be the policy priorities, what the Russian military should look like in the future, and whether these policy priorities would be implemented during the policy process. During this war, the Minister of Defense and the General Staff were criticized uh, so harshly that 
Yevgeny Prigozhin used it, this criticism in his campaign uh, against uh, the Russian government, his, uh, his campaign to gain more, I guess, economic, financial and political power in the Russian system. This, uh, in my view, he misstepped and it uh, resulted in a failed mutiny in June 2023 and his death in August that year. Uh, private military company Wagner now practically does not exist. It was incorporated inside the Ministry of Defense structures and also Rosgvardia, Russian internal troops. And now the troops do jobs both in the African continent, but also in Ukraine. So in this struggle, the Russian civil military, official civil military system uh, has won. Then Andrei Belousev replaced uh, Minister Shoigu as the Russian Ministry of Defense and introduced already several changes. First, his, uh, he, he just general as a very personal system, he brought this new style of leadership. What was surprising to me from the theoretical perspective that for the first time when a civilian, purely civilian politician official appointed as the Minister of Defense, not a single voice against a civilian leading the military in the Russian sort of civil military blogosphere. Before, even when Shoigu was appointed, there were people criticizing, I appointed general as a minister of defense and not a civilian sort of politician, even as the former head of the emergency ministry. This time, absolutely nothing. This probably shows that even the military itself is aware that, finally become aware that uh, the mil being a military officer does not guarantee um, successful leadership of the ministry of defense. He started together, not he started, but together with his appoint, appointment, we've seen a purges of the Shoigu's clan. And over the more than 10 years of Shoigu's tenure in the Ministry of Defense, the individuals he appointed sometimes were even his relatives. For example, his daughter was managing uh, military sports competitions, and there were cases when she wanted to get some tanks without any formal approval. And of course, if this is a daughter of the Ministry of Defense, you would not, even as a military general, disagree with this wishes, despite absolutely no paperwork done for, for whatever reasons. At the same time, there were criminal cases opened against uh, military generals and corrupt officials. Um, there are three, among all of the individuals that were purged or appointed, there are three key uh, changes in my view. This is the state secretary, the head of GUK, the Russian um, main directorate um, for cadres or HR directorate, and deputy, the Russian deputy um, minister of defense for finances. So what do we have here? The state secretary is the key official in the Russian ministry responsible for intergovernmental horizontal cooperation. So the Minister of Defense official, uh, this time Anna Tsevilova, goes to Minister of Finance, the Economy, any other ministries, co and coordinates this intergovernmental um, cooperation. If you look at this table, uh, you can notice that Nikolai Pankov was a highly experienced general. He became the four-star general, which is very rare in the Russian military, the general of the army, in 2004, and had enormous, lots of years of experience of doing his job. And of course, he was a former KGB or FSB alum, if we can say this, and he was the head of the main directorate for caterers before he, be he, he, he became the state secretary. He was removed, he, and uh, who was appointed? Anna Tsevilova. First, a woman, which is still uh, unusual for the Russian military. Second, from the private sector slash regional government, and apparently a relative of Putin, uh, part of Putin's family. Uh, his, her husband is currently the Minister of Energy in Russia. Then the, Yuri Kuznetsov, the former head of the main caterers directorate, was ousted in a, a case open against him for his uh, performance as the head of the AIDS directorate responsible for the IT security and um, uh, clearance, secret, secret clearance in the Russian military. And notice, uh, uh, there is no appointment for the head of the GUK uh, currently. And this is a very, going to be a very interesting development once they decide on who is going to lead it. And finally, it's the Deputy Russian Minister of Defense for Finances. As uh, colleagues previously excellently described, lots of money being poured into the Russian military industrial complex and the military, and they appointed now Leonid Gordon, the, Le Gordon, the former uh, official of the Ministry of Finance, who curated security policy in the Russian Ministry of Finance. A very highly professional individual, and also, again, with experience in the civilian government, and the, who has never had uh, any approach to the Russian uh, military. And additionally, in, uh, to, to this, uh, Pavel Fratkov replaced Timur Ivanov as the Russian um, Deputy Minister of Defense, managing state property. If you remember, in the news, Timur Ivanov is the most filthy rich 
official in the Russian Ministry of Defense. Like it's billions of rubles. He accumulated billions of rubles. And he, who is he? The son of Mikhail Frakhov, ex-prime minister and ex-head of the SVR, Russian civilian intelligence, and again, alum of the FSB Academy. This shows that Russian civil military relations in 2024 is becoming more civilian and personal, uh, co personally connected to the Russian President Putin. Finally, in terms of Russian institutions, what's interesting if we trace all the federal amendments to the Russian federal laws, that it was like a shuttle between the military needs and the consequences of solving these needs. Not the consequences, say, of Ukrainian battlefield successes, but the consequences of the military response, the Russian military response to, uh, to the failures in Ukraine. Several key elements. First is the partial mobilization, then that introduced a lot of societal and economic uh, spillovers, then they had to solve these spillovers by adopting, for example, penalties for not following the mobilization, to address labor short shortages by introducing mobilization deferrals. And again, it showed that the system was too slow to anticipate these, uh, these developments and reactive by responding to the military needs. And second, some people say that general, the partial military mobilization was announced too, too late when the Ukrainian forces has already been succeeding uh, in, in Ukraine. In back in 2022. Then it's the institutionalization of volunteer units in the Russian Ministry of Defense in 2022 and in Rosguardia in 2023. And what's interesting from, from this development that it's volunteer units, wh why they are good for the battle? Because they're very motivated. They actually decided to sign up on the, their own. But at the same time, they are not accustomed to this bureaucratic military, say, culture and approach and respect, for example, to military commanders just by their rank. So it introduced problems. And they also have Important. They have a, a social media baggage behind them. There are those supporters who are staying somewhere in Moscow and tweeting, telegramming, describing there, and also fundraising money for the Russian military. So this introduced constraints for Russian military behavior from within because these volunteer units start to complain if some of the military generals or their commanding officers uh, do, in their view, uh, stupid decisions. So what they did, they introduced, amended a federal law uh, and introduced new disciplinary punishments, now being able to, uh, now, um, being able to uh, enabled by their respective commanders. So the system is again solving the problems it created because of the developments on the battlefield. And lastly is the post, how I call post meeting hangover, the transfer of heavy equipment to Rosguardia, Russian internal troops, for the first time uh, since 1989. Uh, the Soviet Union did this in 1989, and they used these tanks in the first war in Chechnya after already the fall of the Soviet Union, which is in some case I think symbolic and interesting how it's going to be developing in the future. So the preliminary conclusions, and I call it specifically preliminary conclusions, because it's pending the changes in the general staff, whether they would appoint, appoint a new chief of the general staff, the key military leader responsible for uh, command and control in Russian civil military relations. First, and it, it is directly related to the title of this conference, we should not confuse strengths with resilience. Because I think the Russian military and its civil military relations have shown consistent problems with its effectiveness, with its strength, with achieving the desired objective of the civilian government. Not of, you know, moral values of the Russian society or some, something else, the civil, Vladimir Putin personally. It, they've been struggling to achieving what uh, Putin personally wanted. But at the same time, in my view, they're quite resilient. They, despite all the failures, the system keeps working. And I like one phrase that I saw from uh, one of this military blogosphere that about the end, uh, end to the war, that the war uh, cannot end, but can, it can only be stopped by some point by civilian uh, leaders. And lastly, it's uh, the, that the changes in the military leadership um, show currently a trend to greater personification and civilization of the Russian Ministry of Defense. On the one hand, it potentially can increase Russian military effectiveness because uh, now a lot of people saw it, how the Russian civilian government is actually way more effective in fighting you know, uh, this uh, hybrid war uh, um, against Ukraine and the West and protecting the Russian economy. But also this personification introduces critical problems because disagreeing with Putin, no one wants to disagree with Putin, and the accumulation of problems and poor monitoring and evaluation mechanisms can lead to another wave of shocks that would shake Russian civil military relations. And this is it for me now.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirill. We'll get back to these questions in the panel discussion afterwards. Now I'll invite our third and last speaker, Hovar Becken, who's a senior researcher at the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies, with the following title of his presentation. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here not least since I was invited to talk about my primary research interest, the ongoing militarization of Russian society under conditions of war, and in particular, the militarization of children and youth. I would not expect this audience, or any audience, or most audiences, to be very familiar with this topic, so I'll keep it fairly basic. Uh, I will introduce the empirical developments uh, after 2014, and then after 2022, and uh, talk about how they're related to the war itself. Russia has been on undergoing what I would call societal militarization for 30 years now. There have been some hallmark events to spur the development along, but efforts to engage Russian children and youth through military actors, heroic accounts of military history, military uh, aesthetics and traditional military values have persistently grown and grown and grown since the mid-1990s, even predating Putin. So this increasing dosage of uh, militarism promoted through um, the Russian state system is a long-term process that does not hinge solely on Russia's warfare in Ukraine or elsewhere. But um, societal militarization is of course related to war. It can be a precursor to war, uh, by altering the decision-making environment of the state leaders, the military's leader is, uh, will more easily uh, overestimate the usefulness of military force, and the political costs will be lower if society is inclined to see war as normal and necessary. And in wartime itself, all main political drivers of military patriotism are extraordinarily relevant, especially in a war of aggression, so persuasion to fight is even stronger, uh, the need to pers uh, for persuasion. For instance, to keep society united and backing the troops as well as the regime, even in lack of a credible threat to the homeland. To solve long-term manpower issues, which is a persistent problem for Russian authorities. To make society tolerate the wartime cost, including body bags. Um, also, uh, Russia constructs uh, the future history of the present. In other words, in a race for children, the story of the ongoing war, as soon as it starts, how to interpret and frame it. And I don't think the Putin regime cares about convincing children that the war is just unnecessary today. Uh, rather, they want to inculcate the story of the war in Ukraine today for the future. So I will return to this. To summarize, Societal militarization is part of the background to explain Russian decisions to invade, and we might expect it to increase further in wartime and in anticipation of more war to come. I must say I find it extremely interesting to uh, look at youth policy as a suggestion of Russian long-term strategies. What you teach to 10-year-olds now only give political dividends a decade later. So youth policy offers a look into uh, official Russia's vision uh, for what citizens it aims for in the decades to come. Russia wants active patriots for the future, but only within, firmly within the frames of uh, the system. So ideal is the soldier, healthy, polite, non-smoking, without question sacrificing him or herself for the benefit of the state. And if the real if the ideal citizen is seen as the sa with the same qualities as the ideal soldier, this is, of course, a hallmark of uh, militarism. My primary subject uh, of research the last few years has been, uh, and still is, military patriotic clubs. These photos I show are not necessarily this old, from before 2014. They are here for illustrative purposes to highlight tendencies that I find remarkable. 
This is roughly how they look 20 or 10 years ago, rough and unpolished, often led by veterans or sport leaders. Certainly there were many of them across Russia. They were incentivized by so-called state programs of patriotic education from 2001. But this was still a niche activity, not mainstream yet. In late 2014, a new such state program was set up for the next five years. Among its goals was for the state to consolidate its influence over this growing mass of clubs. And in 2015, 2016, a new large military patriotic umbrella organization was established by a presidential decree, Junarmia, many times bigger than any post-Soviet equivalent. And this initiated a new phase or process, uh, what I half-jokingly call the unarmification of Russia. So what constitutes this unarmification? First, Unarmia increased the mainstreaming of militarized patriotism by aiming to become a real seven-digit mass organization and by connecting it to Russian schools, much of which now today have separate Unarmia classrooms. Unarmia today claims to have more than 1.6 million members. Second, unanimification uh, implies the standardization of activities. This does not mean that unanimous squads all over Russia are identical. They are different. But it appears to be a minimum standard for a lot of different activities that all the squads must adhere to. And they, of course, share official goals, they share rituals, they share the uniforms, etc., etc. Third, and as part of this standardization, it should also be mentioned that war commemoration now is a much more important part of military patriotic work uh, in these clubs, at least, than it used to be previously. Fourth, and importantly, United is much more directly associated with the armed forces. This is important for many reasons. For one, they get more professionalized military training than before but also they are much uh, tighter integrated with everyday activity of nearby stationed troops in cultural events, in war commemoration, etc. They're not fighting, but they're part of the military world in most other aspects, at least in some locations. Last but not least, United is much more of a propaganda tool. Uniforms, striking banners, public rituals and performances, parades, meeting politicians on all levels, media coverage, broadcasted concerts, and more. The United Man members are, in a way, living propaganda posters for the Kremlin, showcasing alleged youth support, which is very important for the Kremlin, because it's a persistent problem. We might return to that. Um, support for Russian troops, as well as for the political regime. Okay, so on to 2022. The full-scale Invasion is undoubtedly another hallmark event within this domain, as well as in most other domains in Russia. The ongoing discussions of the proposed Russian state budget suggest an accelerated state push for patriotic education. Reportedly, I haven't uh, checked up myself, the term patriotism is mentioned more than 30 times in the explanatory notes for the state budget alone. I often see references to the increased spending on military patriotic education, but the real costs are, of course, not in rubles, but in the time lost for developing other skills, knowledge of all kinds, critical and creative, uh, creative thinking, playing the piano, or whatever kids would do if not engaged in Unarmia, as some are two hours every day, in addition to summer camps, etc. Uh, the key word to developments after 2022 is expansion on multiple accounts. Expansion in societal pervasiveness, more people, more resources, new school subjects, and acceleration of previous developments, in short. I will not dwell on this. Uh, the second expansion is a new set of activities you can see here, those directly supporting ongoing warfare. And this is all new since 2022. Previously, Unarmia and other clubs uh, were focused on history, museums, military training, sports. They rarely or never comment on political events, not in Syria, rarely on Ukraine. But the intensified war created a need for tackling this, especially as the war came ne nearer to the lives of the children themselves. 
In 2022, after a month of hesitation, they were also caught by surprise, as many others. United and other clubs around Russia started to send letters of support to the quote-unquote defenders of the fatherland, in these triangular shapes here, a reference among many to the Second World War. They started to share memes, like the one you see behind me, as well as other statements of support, sharing patriotic songs, videos, directly referring to the war. They also did a lot of these so-called flash mobs, forming the letter Z, sometimes also V, with their bodies. And from 2022, the regime started to narrate the story for them to remember the war uh, in the future, as I mentioned. So after this war, there will be a massive difference in how it is remembered and how to interpret it. And the primary mode here is not to spread real or fake news to the kids, but to make vague symbolic statements or perform symbolic acts that connect the war to Russian history and patriotic tropes, to heroism, to sacrifice, uh, to the fight against fascism, etc. Like these letters, full of Second World War references that these kids, of course, know by heart. The third development I would like to highlight, and the final one, is the expansion in geographical space into recently occupied territories of Ukraine. Uh, the occupied populations are, in general, subjected to roughly the same militaristic regime as in Russia, though not yet on the same scale. And there are certain differences between different regions, but that would be true also within Russia. Uh, since the Donbass was not declared annexed in the way Crimea was in 2014, uh, the self-declared People's Republics launched their own patriotic education policy, even if mostly copy-paste uh, from the Russian one. A sister organization of United Me was established there in 2019, a key year for the Russification of these areas. Today, and by last year, we could document local United Mea activity in all occupied oblasts of Ukraine. United Mea is there part of Russia's attempt to Russify these territories to alter their social basis permanently, in direct contradiction of all international conventions, so subverting the identity of the local youth in an attempt to make them love the occupant and become Russian patriots. And the same is true for thousands of deported Ukrainian youth who are sent to recently occupied territories into, from recently occupied territories into Crimea, to the Donbass and to Russia proper, temporarily for re-education camps or permanently. So no, no, not only do Russian authorities want them to forget their Ukrainian identity, which would be more than bad enough, also they are brought up under a regime of militarized patriotism. And the consequences for the children themselves and for Ukraine as a state may be dire indeed if this works. In Crimea and the Donbass, children at the age of 9 to 14 years who were put under this regime from 2014 are today between 19 and 20 years old already. Some fighting for Russia in the trenches, some already dead. And the longer the occupation and the Russification lasts, the harder it will be for these territories to again be reintegrated with uh, Ukraine, which from Russia's perspective is of course the whole point. I think I will end there. Thank you. Thank you, Over. Please have a seat and Kirill and Cecilia, please join us on stage. Okay, thank you for this uh, three very different and all very interesting presentations uh, highlighting uh, I don't know, the role and impact of the military uh, in Russia in three, three different ways. I uh, expect that there will be quite a few good questions from uh, our audience. So. Um, 
I will limit myself to a kind of brief discussion and a few questions to, to, to each of you before we open up um, for questions from the audience. We have a bit more than, uh, we have approximately 25, um, 25 minutes. Um, and I'll be begin with you, um, Cecilia. You said that, uh, you, uh, you told me earlier that you felt uh, in this uh, kind of panel and the conference as a bit of an outlier as an economist. And then I said that uh, an outlier in this uh, regard is just, it's a, it's a very welcome uh, contribution and perspective because um, the economy is, um, the economic, economic resources um, always have a huge importance for um, kind of all aspects uh, of uh, all questions that we discuss um, today. Um, and you, you started off by um, saying um, how uh, kind of the most experts and analysts were quite surprised by uh, um, or expected the, the sanctions in 2014 and 2020. 22, um, to have um, kind of a different impact than what uh, turned out to be re the results. Um, kind of, and following up a bit on the discussions in the previous panel, I would like to ask you about how you, um, how you analyze and how you study the Russian economy in this kind of situation when there are uh, kind of many black boxes and uh, kind of statistics that can be difficult to be trusted or are not being published anymore. So kind of what, are the, what are the main challenges? How do you go about solving them? And kind of in, your, in the expert economist community, uh, are, there kind of some, are there major disagreements in interpretations of uh, the perspectives for the Russian economy? Uh, thank you for that uh, question. Um, well, it's, it's of course a big challenge to study the Russian economy now. There's a lot of data that are not published anymore. Um, Russia does not publish how much they export to other countries. Uh, we cannot find data on how the... We, we can find the budgets, but they don't publish how the budgets are being spent by uh, different chapters in afterwards. So the accounts are not accessible anymore. Uh, so, of course, it, it is difficult and um, fortunately I'm not alone on the studying the subject. I have my colleague here, Julia, uh, which I work together with. Uh, she's a um, Russian expert and she, uh, together we p put the economist view and, uh, <coughs> and, and uh, the state uh, understanding from the Russian economy, how it works from Julia together. So we use multiple source data. Uh, and um, and uh, it's like you can't always trust the Russian data from Rostat, whether the economy is really going well or not. So we have to go through multiple different sources. Um, because uh, the Rostat says that the Russian economy is growing. It's like, is this really true? We have to go through the other factories as well. Well, and then we find that unemployment levels are low as well. And we find that uh, the Levada um, uh, questionnaires show that people are optimistic about their economic future. Uh, and uh, companies report that they have difficulties in employing new employees and that they have to spend a lot of uh, cost of wage increases in order to attract personnel. And we add all these factors together. It can't be a systematic lie <laughs> about the whole situation. So uh, it might be that the inflation rates that we find in the studies are not accurate, but at least we know enough that it, it's the trend that matters. So that's what we normally look at, how are the trends going? Uh, and that gives like the overall picture. And whether we, the economy will grow by 3% or 4% this year, it's not that important, it's more the trends. So that's how, how we do it. And what about uh, disagreements? Because I've been, in the, especially in the beginning, maybe wishful thinking on parts so of many, but talk about the uh, Russian economy collapsing. Are, are there many kind of still uh, analysis and interpretations pointing in that uh, direction? Or are, is there some kind of more of a consensus along the lines that you uh, sketched out for us? Well, predictions about the future is always a difficult uh, thing to do. 
how will it end that because um, expected events uh, can incur. So about the future path ahead, of course, there are disagreements. How fast will it go? For, when will the uh, Russian economy collapse? Will it collapse? Those are disagreements. But uh, regarding the situation right now, I think there's a general agreement that the Russian economy is booming and that they are spending a lot of the booming economy on defense. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Kirill, um, I think while kind of the two other presentations kind of pointed to uh, kind of the military kind of and military spending and military kind of ideology, as it were, uh, takes more space uh, in in Russia. Then you, your kind of argument is that uh, when it comes to the military itself, it's uh, not it doesn't really work like that with the civilian uh, leadership. Uh, on the contrary, you know, meddling more and having more kind of meddling more into what perhaps uh, theoretically could be the more kind of autonomous sphere of the military. Um, if I understand you correctly, and I, my my question is um, kind of a naive one. I'm certainly not an expert in uh, in uh, kind of the, the questions you're researching. So, um, if I understand you correctly, there is uh, probably some kind of theoretical grounds to say that uh, there is a division of labor between the civilian and military leadership, and if the military leadership is uh, kind of given their autonomy, then they, they will solve their tasks more efficiently, which uh, perhaps was not the case in 2022. But And then you say that, uh, uh, based on this analysis, that uh, the picture seems to be kind of, the civilians uh, kind of intruding even more. Um, so then my question is, if you want, would like to uh, uh, speculate a bit, perhaps, what, what are the, the reasons? Are, is there Kind of mistrust on part of the civilians to the uh, military leadership. Uh, is there kind of overconfidence uh, in the leadership, civilian leadership that they actually know how to do this uh, better? Are there other reasons? And I mean, you, you uh, discussed this on towards the end of the some pros and cons uh, from a certain perspective towards the end of your discussion. But could could this be kind of some? Good news for those who do not wish uh, the military, the Russian military, success. <laughs> is my <laughs> question to you. Yeah, um, thanks a lot for this. Um, just a, a bit of background: military autonomy is important as as long as it keeps producing effective results. As long as the military uh, um, fulfills its mission for, well, in civilian times, defending the country and you know. Uh, uh, shows the results, then it's good and theoretical implication of civil military relations why it's important to keep military autonomy. In the Russian case, actually, uh, the military autonomy in this post Soviet uh, period was um, a thing that prevented Russia from achieving military effectiveness. Um, to, make, to cut it short, because in a lot of cases, military leadership wanted to build a Soviet military in the country that is no longer the Soviet Union. And the periods when this military autonomy was breached, especially 2007 to 2012, during the reform of uh, Serdyukov, for instance, this was the period when the civilians actually imposed, and sometimes very harshly, harshly, some, some people actually in the military leadership suicided in, in that period, disagreeing with the changes, um, and imposed severe changes that brought positive for the Russian government uh, um, outputs, results. Um, 2012, the reform finished. Two years later, Russian troops annexed Crimea and started the war in Ukraine in 2014 and, you know, uh, support the uh, uh, Eastern separatists in, in the Donbas. Um, currently, there are so many problems with the Russian military uh, that they uh, failed to solve. Some they did, and that's why uh, Russia keeps fighting that I think in the civilian government there is an understanding, and Putin personally, that it's time, especially when there is a military uh, advantage, superiority, current temporary military superiority over Ukraine, uh, you, you know, you don't mean just to look at the map, uh, there is a period when they, I think they can potentially introduce this again, uh, limit military autonomy, introduce changes that would be beneficial for them. 
But again, the key ingredient that is missing, who would be leading the general staff then? Because uh, again, General Gerasimov is representative of the old guard, if you can say so. He's been for many years already. And if, uh, in my view, if they really want to achieve success in improving the military, they, they need to change this uh, official. Um, the good news for, I think, all normal people is that um, in this system, where again, uh, in this highly personalized Russian civil military relations, giving even more power for the president to intervene when there is no real objective uh, procedures, more or less functional, to give evidence for decision makers in the civilian government about what's happening in, in the armed forces, let alone on the front line, which is even worse than in civilian period, uh, greatly increases the likelihood of, uh, of a failure, of a, sh a shocking failure. Because if they start to, for example, do implement changes that would, what they did in 2008, 2012, it would be such a destabilizing event because the military is fighting a war that would, again, in my view, produce with a high degree of certainty uh, severe disagreements, problems on the front line, problems with the supplies of the troops, and so, so forth, you name it, depending on, on the scale of changes. So, and this is a highly personal system, again, and we, we always should always think about the Ukrainian side because they are also aware of this and they can do some, uh, so let's say, operations that would uh, push Russia to make mistakes. Uh, this creates an, an opportunity, a space for opportunities uh, for, for, for um, making a mistake in, uh, in the Russian system. Um, in terms of overconfidence, I don't think uh, they, the decision makers can be overconfident, but currently, I mean, they, they have some evidence that, again, uh, comparatively to Ukraine, relatively to Ukraine, Russia has some superiority, and again, they have uh, a momentum to, to do something to achieve, uh, well, what they want, uh, some sort of victory against Ukraine. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, I will think I'll continue my hunt for Good news. Um, I think I will, because um, um, I mean, just the title of your presentation. It's um, you have studied kind of this um, patriotic uh, education upbringing, uh, so that documented theorized about it for for a very long long time. And when you look at this, uh, it often seems like this just steady, linear, dark development with. Uh, Know, more and more focus on the military, more and more focus on kind of social cohesion and agreement. Um, so I would like you to reach for some straws. Is there, in all this kind of material and in your studies, are there any kind of positive uh, news, some positive developments? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, not necessarily positive news, good news, or positive developments, but my answer will be close to that of Kirill's, that our uh, hope lies in the relative weakness of the Russian system to achieve its aims in this regard as well. Because the, the key question here is, of course, does it work? Uh, if this doesn't work, then it's not too much to worry about, right? Uh, and. The simple answer is we don't really know whether it works. We have experiences from uh, the Soviet Union, for instance, where appearances were kept, kept up until suddenly everything collapsed very quickly. And uh, nobody would kind of, or a few um, growing up under the system of patriotic education would um, kind of see it as um, decisive for their support with the Soviet system later. Um, I have two takes on the two kind of um, pathways to claim that Russian uh, Russia is fairly weak in implementing this policy. And the one is that patriotic education has always been promoted from a position of we perceived weakness. We need patriotic education, the Russian decision makers say, because the youth are not patriotic, right? So it's basically a way to tackle a problem. Uh, and this is very important because it has been the case since the late 90s and all the way up until today. The kids are not patriotic enough. And when the Russian uh, patient here uh, does not respond to this medicine, the Russian state keeps in increasing the dosage. But there is nothing radical and new about uh, the development through these 30 years. So we, we know that the, the, um, the medicine is not perfect, right? 
Um, the second indication is a survey and some other um, research done on focus groups on the perceptions of youth. Um, I did a, a specific survey on the, on the um, support for militaristic policy in the Russian population uh, in 2018, and uh, there the youth is clearly the least supportive, even if they have already then been subjected, some of them for their entire lives of patriotic education, they support uh, war to a lesser degree, they support uh, the military's role in education to a lesser degree, they support military role models in fiction to a lesser degree than the adult population. So I, I hear people talking about a um, generation of brainwashed Russian youth, but I don't think we are there, uh, at least not yet. Uh, so that's, uh, we always need to look to the youth for hope, I guess. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks for the positive note and for also for um, linking it uh, back to the conference's overall theme as well, with strengths and, and weaknesses. Um, we have nine, nine minutes left before, before lunch, um, so I would like to open the, um, the floor for questions from the audience. Christine will identify you, and please introduce yourself, and please be as concise and pointed in your questions as possible, then we will have the time to, uh, to uh, address more, more questions from you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'll be short, concise, and precise. Gerflik, yeah, Professor, University of Oslo. I have a question for Cecilia concerning uh, the availability of military hardware. Of course, there are some things that you cannot trace, but we see that Russia is building alliances to countries in order to get access to a specific hardware that makes it possible for them to continue the war. Um, so how much is that really um, helping, I mean, in terms of uh, increasing military expenditures and buying off hardware elsewhere to use in the war. Are they successful in doing that or are they not successful? And the other question goes to Kirill Shaimiev, and I, I, this is the question that everybody gets in terms of rotations and allocations in the upper level of uh, the executive in the Russian Federation. So um, there were some rumors about people being moved into certain positions uh, in order to close the circle around Putin and also to prepare maybe for the day that Putin will resign in some way. Again, speculations, or is there anything in it that you could read from these uh, allocations that would point in a direction of something vaguely similar to that? Thank you. Yeah. Um Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting panel. Ingrid Oftal, Institute for Defence Studies. Uh, I have a question for you, Cecilia, um, but uh, I suppose it can actually be extended to, especially to the other speakers, especially Kirill Shmi as, as well, because uh, what, what, you, you, what you are sort of implying in your uh, presentation is a, a sort of a muddling through situation that, it's, that there are imbalances, uh, Russia can meddle through at least for a while, um, and that while is a bit further off than than uh, many people would perhaps hope for. Uh, certainly, I would. Uh, but but we have seen muddling through in many cases, also in Russia historically, also in a sort of fairly recent history. Um, and, that, and that's the natural first question then is, what is the breaking point? Are there certain things that we should watch? Um, and uh, from your perspective as an economist, uh, for example, um, is, is for example the institutional um, autonomy uh, of the central bank, uh, how sustainable uh, do you think that is? Uh, so uh, issues like that I, would be interesting to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, I think the questions are addressed to Cecilia and Kirill. Uh, who wants to start? You want to start? Um, okay, so if I caught the question correctly, you were asking whether uh, Russia was successful in buying hardware enough for, uh, for sustaining the war. <coughs> and um, uh, I don't uh, follow on what the, it's like the most important things are the ability to deliver missiles and ammunition. And, um, uh, I don't know 
how much they get to delivered each month and the production rates. Uh, but uh, I think that um, that Russia has to import ammunition uh, and missiles from like North Korea and Iran is a sign that everything is not going perfectly well within the Russian economy. I, th I think that they would prefer to produce this themselves. However, uh, it might go through some time being able to build up the production lines, so I don't know how this will develop in the future. Um, and if I take the second question um, from Ingrid, uh, middle, the breaking point for the Russian economy, um, and the, of what is that? Uh, I don't know when that happens or if it happens. Um, if, if, if there is like a really hard landing in the Russian economy, but I don't, if it really runs down and a lot of unemployment happens, that, that could probably be really hard for the Russian economy. But then again, it's like the oral state that goes so deeply into the all of the economy, which you can use so many measures. Like they have put in um, sub, um, cheaper bank loans for the ones that are hired within the defense industry for one private bank. It's, it's like all these little measures that we would not expect to happen in a normal Western economy. So, um, yeah, but I think that, that is, like you point out, that the independence of the Russian Central Bank is really helpful. They've been strong and been able to make good plans for how to sustain the, the economy through these difficult times. Um, and I think that the measures they put up was uh, a huge impact on Russia's ability to, to stay put and maintain the economy during the first year of war, which was obviously the most difficult one to get by. So, yeah, I think you think you have a good point there about the independence of the central bank. You know, yeah, my short answer would be on the first one, uh, Putin uh, potentially re resigning. Definitely not now. I don't see any evidence on this. On, uh, three layers, uh, three factors. First, because I do think they, they believe they are going to win this war. And as the commander in chief and the president, why would he even consider leaving if he's going to be victorious in this? Second, it's historical. I like the case of Kazakhstan when Russia actually saved uh, Tokayev's uh, President uh, Tokayev, but also Nazarbayev's system by intervening when there was civil, uh, severe unrest, who would support Putin if the same thing happens? And I guess there was some kind of intra-elite struggle in Kazakhstan back then, and that Russia helped to stop. Uh, to, and third, it's uh, personally, if we see all the leaked documents, the insider and all the excellent Russian investigative journalists, they invest so much in his personal safety and well-being, like in modernizing planes, trains, and everything. It shows that he's really concerned about his personal safety. On the breaking point, I think um, I would a bit reframe it. Uh, this breaking point would involve, in my view, a combination of structural deficiencies with active uh, measures of Russia's adversaries, be it uh, domestic, I don't know, intra-elite struggles or Ukraine or any other powers, but also the use of uh, problems that they're having, both institutional or with the economy, you name it, or intra-ethnic relationship, for example. So once there is someone c who can combine this, and then, the, the, I th in my view, this could be a breaking point. This, uh, but the broader discussions, for example, when people were referring to the Kursk invasion, I think there was a uh, calculation that would somehow affect Russian leadership. I think it was too weak, just an example of how things can go. If it was combined with something else, yes, it could have been uh, more uh, effective. But uh, this is kind of the light of thinking of how I see uh, potential future in Russia. Thank you. That is uh, what we had uh, time for, two pieces of uh, practical information. Now lunch will be served uh, right outside of this um, hall. Please be back at 12.40 for the keynote speech by Timothy Fry. And uh, join me in thanking the panel for sharing their knowledge and reflections with us.